In an earlier episode, we described the early church fathers as falling into three categories, the apostolic fathers, the apologists, and the theologians. While there's some overlap time-wise, Generally, the period of the Apostolic Fathers was from the end of the first to the mid-second century. Now, the Apostolic Fathers were apostles so much as followers and students of the apostles. They were leaders who had a close relationship with them. And then from the mid-second century through the end of the third is the time of the apologists. Called that because while carrying out their work as pastors, they took a lead in defending the faith against attacks both from without and from within. Following the apologists were the theologians, who provided leadership of the church from the beginning of the 4th through the 6th centuries. Their work hammered out precisely what it was that Christians believed regarding some of the more complex aspects of the faith. We ended the previous episode with a look at the apologist Justin Martyr, who wrote two important defenses of the faith and addressed them to a couple of the Roman emperors. Antonius Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. We're going to look now at another important apologist, Irenaeus. But before diving into his story, let me be clear for those who may be unfamiliar with that term, apologist. The modern English word apology, it means to say that you're sorry for something. You know, it's an acceptance of blame and a way to restore goodwill, hopefully. But that's not what the apologists that we're considering gave. They had nothing to be sorry for. The word comes from the Greek word apologia, and it means a formal defense of one's position. It's a legal word. An apologia was something that an attorney would prepare going into court, an attempt to prove something by the use of evidence and reason. And that's why today a term apologetics is used for defending the faith. The tradition of apologetics goes all the way back to the earliest days of church history when the Christian faith was making inroads into the pagan world. The apologists were those church fathers, that is, pastors of local churches, who composed a kind of legal brief for Roman officials, from local magistrates and provincial governors all the way up to the emperor, explaining why persecution of the followers of Jesus was unwise policy. Now, one of the premier apologists who was also one of the earliest theologians was Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon in France. His career was spent battling the dangerous threat of Gnosticism that we looked at in episode 9. Born in Asia Minor, most likely the city of Smyrna, about 135, Irenaeus was influenced by the apostolic father and student of the Apostle John, Polycarp. Irenaeus was deeply affected by his mentor, saying that he wrote down what he had learned from him, not on paper, but on his heart. After attending school in Rome, Irenaeus was a missionary to southern Gaul. He served as an elder in a couple of churches and witnessed the severe persecution of believers during the reign of Marcus Aurelius. Now, during this time, the Montanus controversy broke, and we learned through Irenaeus that it was a debate that many church leaders weighed in on. Some regarded the Montanus as heretics who ought to be banned, Others found their theology aberrant, but didn't qualify as outright heresy. They argued that the Montanists ought to be reined in, not kicked out. The churches of southern Gaul, where Irenaeus served, were of this second group, and in 178 sent him to Rome to voice their opinion. When Irenaeus returned to Lyon, he learned that its bishop had been martyred, and so he was selected to fill his place. From then until his death, 14 years later, Irenaeus stayed a busy man. He was a prolific writer, a tireless pastor, and a missionary. Irenaeus proved to be a great asset for the church in the later 2nd century and provided a solid foundation for the church of the next 200 years. While he struggled with the native language of Gaul, he was a master of Greek. He was adept at using Greek culture, language, and thought forms in the defense of the faith and helped lay a philosophical and theological foundation that later church leaders drew on. Irenaeus' spiritual lineage from Christ was short. Though he lived toward the end of the second century, his mentor was the long-lived Polycarp, a disciple of the long-lived Apostle John. That helps us put his emphasis on apostolic succession in perspective. Now, this became a key concept in his writing. Irenaeus didn't argue for some kind of dynastic principle in church leadership so much as the idea that the faith itself, its doctrines, tenets, values, and mission were drawn from the original apostles, 
passed on to their followers, and then passed on to the next generation, and so forth. Irenaeus made it clear that church leaders obtain authority only to the degree that they're loyal to the foundation the apostles laid. Their authority was derived directly from their adherence to what was already given. It did not originate with them or merely in the office they held. Now, church leaders today would do well to remember this principle of authority when they're pressed to compromise with the world on moral and spiritual issues. The authority of pastors and church leaders comes from God. It does not adhere to their office in the church. A title means nothing, no matter how big the hat or fancy the label. God gives authority to fulfill His calling and mission for that person. When they step outside that role, they possess no real authority. The authority of the minister is derived and directly proportional to their loyalty to the apostolic mission and message. That's what Irenaeus said in his writings. And while there was an extension of that principle into the realm of church leadership, Irenaeus didn't advocate some kind of spiritual dynastic principle whereby church leadership and hierarchy was bequeathed by one leader to the next. Irenaeus was a fierce opponent of error and schism, and the most orthodox of the Anti-Nicene Fathers. It may be of interest to some that Irenaeus, along with the church father Papias, and most of his contemporaries were premillennial in their eschatological views. Those views were later abandoned by the church as being too Jewish in origin. While laboring hard for the spread and defense of the faith on earth, Irenaeus was gazing up into heaven like the original disciples, anxiously waiting for the return of the Lord to establish his kingdom. Irenaeus was the first of the church fathers to make full use of the New Testament. While the Gnostics that he had spent much of his time refuting wanted to carve up the Bible, whittling it down to just a handful of texts, Irenaeus referred to all four Gospels and nearly all of the epistles as Scripture. Though he had great zeal for essential doctrine, Irenaeus was tolerant towards differences over non-essentials. He urged the Bishop of Rome to lighten up in his demands about how and when people could celebrate the resurrection. Two major works of Irenaeus have survived, Against Heresies and The Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching. Against Heresies was written about 185 while he was the bishop there at Lyon. It's aimed at the era of Gnosticism, and it has five parts. Book one is a historical sketch of various Gnostic sects alongside a statement of Christian faith. Book two was a philosophical critique of Gnosticism, while book three is a scriptural critique, and book four answers Gnosticism from the words of Christ himself. It then wraps up with book five, which is a vindication of the resurrection against Gnostic arguments denying it. In a quote from early in the work, Irenaeus says, quote, Error is never set forth in its naked deformity, lest, being thus exposed, it should at once be detected. But it is craftily decked out in an attractive dress, so as, by its outward form, to make it appear to the inexperienced more true than the truth itself. Unquote. Irenaeus has been called the father of church dogmatics because he sought to formulate the principles of Christian theology and provided an exposition of the church's beliefs. That was especially clear in his other writing, The Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching. There, he laid down the premise that the Christian faith finds its revelation and authority in the scriptures. He referred to both the Old and the New Testaments to prove that point, and as I said, he quotes from all but four of the New Testament books. Irenaeus is an important figure for the development of Christian theology because in his battle with Gnosticism, he laid down the principle of recapitulation. That's the idea that Jesus Christ is the core. He's the essence of all true theology. He's both creator and redeemer. What was lost in Adam is regained in Christ, the second Adam, or the last Adam. What he says about Jesus, as drawn from the scriptures, would be used later by the theologians when they had their discussions on the nature of Christ. Now, besides these two works we know were authored by Irenaeus, there are several other fragments and some works attributed to him by people like the first church historian Eusebius. We're going to skip reviewing all of those, except one of them that deserves mention. In the Epistle to Florinus, 
Irenaeus writes to a friend who at one time served with him in ministry. They'd grown up together in the faith, side by side at the feet of Polycarp. Forinus became an elder at the Church of Rome, but he was deposed when he embraced Gnosticism. Irenaeus tenderly reminded him of their friendship and past. You can hear the ache in Irenaeus' words that someone who'd been so close and so clear on the things of God could throw it all aside for the silliness of Gnostic drivel. Irenaeus dissects their air so skillfully, it's difficult to imagine anyone could read the letter and not return to the faith of his youth. Well, we have no idea what became of Florinus. But now we're going to turn to another theologian of the Church Fathers. This one proves to be rather controversial. Origin of Alexandria. Now, Origen was what some would call a religious fanatic, who gave up his job, slept on the floor, ate no meat, drank no wine, fasted twice a week, owned no shoes, and according to one account, castrated himself for the faith. He was also one of the most prolific scholars of his age, penning hundreds of manuscripts. He was a first-rate philosopher and profound student of scripture. So outstanding in resisting the forces against him that Origen was nicknamed Adamantius, Man of Seal. A child prodigy, Origen was born near Alexandria in Egypt about 185. The oldest of seven children, he grew up in a Christian home, learning the Bible and the meaning of commitment. In 202, his father, Leonidas, was beheaded for the faith in one of those spasmodic rounds of persecution at the hands of hostile Roman officials during the reign of Septimius Severus. The grief-stricken 17-year-old Origen wanted to join his father as a martyr, but his mother prevented him from leaving the house by hiding his clothes. <laughs> so I guess he was willing to die in public, but not go out naked in it. Sounds like a typical 17-year-old. <laughs> Origen quickly realized that he had more to offer than martyrdom and went to work to support his family. He started a grammar school, copied texts, and instructed new believers in the basics of the faith. While engaged in all of that, he studied under a pagan philosopher, Ammonius Saccas, to better defend his faith against the arguments of hostile pagans. As a pagan, Ammonius might have been hostile to Christianity, but he was an early thinker in a line of philosophy called Neoplatonism that would soon dominate the pagan world. So popular and influential was Neoplatonism that not a few Christian theologians adopted some of its thought forms, not least of which was Augustine of Hippo, whose impact on theology cannot be overstated. There's a good chance that some of Ammonius' ideas crept into origins. As persecution went on, Origen boldly visited the imprisoned, attended their trials, and comforted the condemned. His fame spread, and the number of his students increased rapidly. The bishop of Alexandria at the time was Demetrius, with whom Origen had a hot and cold relationship. There were brief seasons of goodwill that were broken by longer periods of antagonism between the two. Now, Origen was by far the sharper intellect, and seems that Demetrius was jealous of him. He demanded that Origen limit himself to teaching students issues of doctrine alone. He was not allowed to preach. Around 211 to 212, during the reign of the emperor Caracalla, Origen visited Rome. The moral laxity that he witnessed among church officials really disturbed him. Origen was a confirmed ascetic, committed to self-discipline and an austere lifestyle that shunned anything even hinting at a weakening of moral virtue. On his return to Alexandria, he resumed his teaching with a zeal increased by his determination to not follow the poor example that he had seen at the heart of the empire. Now, as an aside, as I record this episode, I'm teaching through the Epistle of James at the church that I pastor in Southern California. David Guzik has just completed a series of quick studies in James here on the Enduring Word YouTube channel. Though James was probably the earliest book of the New Testament, written right around 45 AD, just a dozen years after Jesus, he was already seeing a problem in the church in Jerusalem. People's walk didn't match their talk. They said the right things, but they didn't do them. The church that had been so remarkable in its commitment to both love and holiness seemed to be losing its grip on them. And so James wrote a letter filled with strong words calling the followers of Jesus to make sure they were living out their faith in what they said and what they did. 
from Origen's report on what he witnessed in Rome in the early 3rd century, it seems that James's letter had been ignored. Well, when he returned to Alexandria from Rome, he found that his school had outgrown the capacity of a single instructor and administrator. The students clamored for more instruction, and graduates wanted materials to help them study the Bible. Origen then brought on others and increasingly devoted himself to the study of the Bible and producing high-quality resources. To that end, he learned Hebrew so that he could get at the text of the Old Testament more efficiently. It was at this time, about 212, that Origen became friends with a wealthy Ambrose of Alexandria. Ambrose was a Gnostic, whom Origen persuaded to renounce his errant views and become a Christian. Their friendship continued for years. In appreciation of Origen's friendship and concern for his soul, Ambrose provided several secretaries to help copy Origen's copious writings. Many of Origen's works were dedicated to this patron. In 214, Origen visited Arabia and the Holy Land. The following year, a popular uprising in Alexandria caused the Emperor Caracalla to allow his soldiers to loot the city. The schools were closed, foreigners were expelled, and that included Ambrose, so Origen went with him. They took refuge in Caesarea on the coast of Israel. And though he wasn't an ordained priest, the bishop of both Jerusalem and Caesarea asked Origen to carry on temporary preaching ministries in the local churches. Well, that was in line with the practice of the churches in Israel, it most certainly was not allowed by Bishop Demetrius back in Alexandria. So when Origen returned there in 216, Demetrius was furious and he limited Origen's ongoing work. Now, of his activity over the next decade, little's known. He likely engaged mostly in writing and the instruction of new believers. Origen well understood the threat posed by Gnosticism. He also understood that when Gnosticism eventually disappeared, another heir would rise to replace it. The only way to deal with coming waves of heretical challenge was to provide tools for believers to use to study and understand the Bible. And to that end, Origen produced the Hexapla, which was an early form of what we know today as a parallel Bible. The Hexapla had the original Hebrew text of the Old Testament, a Greek transliteration, and then several other Greek translations, all arranged in six parallel columns. One of these Greek translations he found in a jar in the city of Jericho. The Hexapla was a massive undertaking requiring 28 years to complete. It was an important part of the development of the New Testament canon and helped shape scriptural translation. Unfortunately, it was lost. It was so massive that modern scholars doubt that anyone ever copied it entirely. We know of its existence because portions of it managed to survive, and it's referenced in several comments by contemporaries of that time. Now, Origen might rightly be called the first Bible scholar who analyzed the scriptures on three levels, the literal, the moral, and the allegorical. As Origen himself put it, quote, For just as man consists of body, soul, and spirit, so in the same way does scripture, unquote. In truth, Origen preferred an allegorical approach because it allowed for more spiritual interpretations. There were many passages that he considered impossible to understand literally, but could be viewed allegorically and could be instrumental in deepening one's relationship with God and others. Now, sadly, Origen's method of allegorical interpretation became the standard for Bible study for later church ages and, unfortunately, ended up leading many astray. We'll return to that in a bit. The prolific nature of Origen's work makes narrowing down his most important contributions to theology a challenge. I think that if we have to pick one, it would probably be his On First Principles. It was the first systematic exposition of Christian theology ever written. He created a distinctly Christian philosophy by synthesizing Greek techniques of analysis with biblical texts. Added to the massive works of the Hexapla and the Principles, his many homilies and commentaries, it's clear how he could keep seven secretaries busy and cause the later church father Jerome to say in frustrated admiration, quote, has anyone read everything that Origen wrote, unquote? Well, what we've looked at so far makes Origen out to be solid. He wasn't without warts. In fact, one of the later church councils went so far as to label Origen a heretic. In 
But as we'll see, those councils they weren't always the most unbiased and righteous courts of discernment. Some were far from it. It was Origen's method for interpreting scripture that got him into trouble. He advocated the idea that the real meaning of a text wasn't its straightforward literal reading, but that scripture had an allegorical meaning, and that was the primary purpose of the text. Finding the allegorical key was the main point, Origen said. Now, while there is certainly deep allegory to some of scripture, the vast majority of the biblical text ought to be understood as literally as the genre and the context allow. But those who followed Origen took his idea of allegory too far, and they made allegory the main interpretive method for all of Scripture. This methodology for understanding the Bible held sway for hundreds of years and ended up countering the very thing that Origen had set out to do, make the Bible accessible to all believers. You see, in the allegorical method of interpretation, only those educated in the often esoteric symbols of the allegorists can rightly interpret and understand the Word of God. Another thing that Origen did which had a negative effect on the church was his, well, fanatical dedication to self-denial. Origen was so anxious to present himself to God as holy that he engaged in practices that were surely aberrant. His fastidious devotion to asceticism encouraged the extreme monastics of later times. He denied himself sleep, engaged in extreme fasting, went barefoot, not that going barefoot is wrong, but it becomes wrong when the message that's communicated by having no shoes is that wearing them is evil, which it seems was the message that Origen aimed to get across. Now, there's one aspect of his asceticism that bears recounting because modern students of church history often hear only a partial story. A fuller report is warranted as it illustrates how more knowledge on a subject often sheds a different light on the how and why of things that the ancients did. Origen's intense zeal for holiness moved him, when he was young and immature, to castrate himself. Yes, you heard me correctly, he castrated himself. Ouch. His motive was to avoid any potential for scandal because of his instruction of women. Now, now this is interesting, because though Origen later developed an allegorical method of interpretation, when he was younger he took Matthew chapter 19 verse 12 literally when it says, quote, there are those who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, unquote. The early church historian Eusebius says that Origen's self-castration was, quote, proof of an inexperienced and youthful heart, but also of faith and self-control, unquote. It seems that Origen later thought better of this youthful act. In his commentary on Matthew, he condemned those who took chapter 19, verse 12 literally, and said that such an action was an outrage. Based on this, modern skeptics contend that the report of Origen's self-castration must be false. But <laughs> Origen goes on in his writing to speak of the physical problems resulting from castration in a way that suggests some personal experience. Now, this isn't all that got Origen into trouble with later church leaders. While some of his writings were surely hypothetical, Origen taught the pre-existence of the soul. That is, that a person's spirit exists before conception and that all spirits had fallen into sin before birth. Furthermore, he said that these sinful spirits were then enslaved in bodies in proportion to the grievousness of the sins that they had committed before being embodied. As a result, some were made demons, some men, and some angels. He also believed that all spirits could be saved, even Satan. But what got Origen into the biggest trouble doctrinally was his description of the Trinity. He said that it was a hierarchy where Father, Son, and Spirit were not equal. Though he attacked Gnostic beliefs, like them, he rejected the goodness of material creation. Three centuries after his death, the Council of Constantinople pronounced Origen a heretic. But file that factoid away for later, because we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this topic of church debates over the Trinity and the nature of Christ in upcoming episodes. The 4th and 5th centuries were dominated by these debates, and while the issue is largely settled for us today, we ought to have a better appreciation for the agony, really, that the Church endured for 200 years as its elders and leaders tried to figure all of this out. The question is, did Origen really mean that the Father, Son, and Spirit weren't equal? 
thus making him a genuine heretic? Or by referring to them as a hierarchy, was he speaking of their submission to each other in the relational matrix of the Trinity? <laughs> There's the rub. Now, in order to answer that, we need to know what Origen and later writers meant by the words they used to describe what they believed. And listen, that's not an easy task, especially when someone like Origen was oblivious to the arguments and the debates that would rage 200 and 300 years later. Many scholars now contend that Origen was merely trying to frame the faith in and by the ideas of his time. But after the Council of Constantinople, his works were suppressed. Many of them were rounded up and burned, making modern evaluation difficult. Origen's work against Celsus is one of the finest defenses of Christianity produced in the early church. Answering the charge that Christians, by refusing military service, failed the test of good citizenship, he wrote this, quote, We, who by our prayers destroy all demons which stir up wars, violate oaths, and disturb the peace, are of more help to the emperors than those who seem to be doing the fighting, unquote. Well, the authorities weren't convinced. In 250, the Emperor Decius had Origen imprisoned and tortured. He was deliberately kept alive in the hope that he would renounce his faith. You see, the thought of officials was that Origen was already so influential during his lifetime, if he recanted, well, it would devastate the faith of many Christians. Whether it would or not is in doubt. You know, we're seeing a departure from the faith by a number of church leaders and well-known musicians in our time. And while their apostasy does impact a few, it tends to stand more as a warning to believers than an encouragement to turn their backs on the Savior. Decius died before Origen's execution took place and the persecution the emperor had called for ended, and so Origen was set free. His health broken, he died shortly after his release. <laughs>